Welcome to the Intelligent Investing Podcast, where modern portfolio theory can suck it. A student of the school of Graham and Doddsville and a clergy member of the Church of Warren Buffett, here's your host, Eric Schlein. Hi, this is Eric Schlein. You're listening to the Intelligent Investing Podcast, and today we are going to discuss this morning's Berkshire Hathaway letter from the 2019 annual letter Um, just came out this morning and I'm sure many of you like myself woke up extra early to read the letter it was a quite a short letter this year uh, similar to last year's even I think a little bit shorter Um, this is going to be a pretty quick episode there isn't actually much to discuss the you know, on the first page of the letter he talks about you know he says Berkshire earned eighty one and a half billion dollars in twenty nineteen according to Gap and then he discusses that the figure um, twenty uh, that's twenty four billion dollars of operating earnings and three point seven billion dollars of realized capital gains and then fifty three point seven from uh, net unrealized capital gains and then he just talks about how he thinks the new accounting rules so for those who aren't familiar um in 2019 there was a new accounting rule according to the generally accepted accounting principles gap which i will refer to for the rest of the show and basically it makes you he actually says that he says uh, it requires a company holding equity securities to include in earnings the net change and the unrealized gains and losses of those securities. So essentially, if you hold a stock portfolio and you have an operating business as well, so you have an operating business that also has a stock portfolio attached, if your stock portfolio, you know, let's say you have a, a million dollar stock portfolio and it goes up 100%, now you have, you have unrealized capital gains of a million dollars, well, that would count as a million dollars down on the income statement, which doesn't really make sense. It's a really stupid rule, and it ends up skewing quarterly earnings. So you end up having these wild swings in quarterly earnings um, at Berkshire Hathaway. So he says, you know, the, really the way you got to look at it is you got to remove any unrealized gains or losses to get a real sense of what the earnings power of the business is. So that's really that's really all. The first page. He also starts to talk about the power of retained earnings, and the um, it's a cool story. He, he talks about a guy named Edward uh, Edgar Lawrence Smith, uh, an obscure economist and financial advisor who wrote a book in 1924 called "Common Stocks as Long Term Investments," a slim book that changed the investment world. I actually will confess I've never heard of this book, and he said that the book actually changed Smith himself forcing him to reassess his own investment beliefs. And he actually had said that going into the book, um, Smith was going to use the book to argue that bonds perform better during inflationary periods. Um, Sorry, that stocks would perform better than bonds during inflationary periods and that bonds would deliver superior returns during deflationary periods. Um, but Smith discovered through the book and through his own research um, that that was not the case and that stocks had a component to them that had them outperform uh, long term, which was that element of compound interest and that if a business uh, retained its earnings invested in the business and then could compound the business, um, that's where the real growth came. And this was during a time where people looked at stocks And so I'll actually quote Buffett here, and he says, um, It was no secret that, after all, mind-boggling wealth had been amassed by titans such as Carnegie, Rocker, and Feller, and Ford, all of whom had retained a huge portion of their business earnings to fund growth and produced ever greater profits. But then he says, this is what's interesting, and you can still see this today, where you have people who... the. I actually had had a friend of mine where he, you know he was very good at investing in private businesses, but then when it came to the stock market, it's like his brain turned to mush and all the principles went out the window. He didn't understand it was you're dealing with the same principles. So so Buffett goes, 
Nevertheless, when business ownership was sliced into small pieces, small pieces, stocks, buyers in the pre-Smith years usually thought of their shares as a short-term gamble on market movements. Even at their best, stocks were considered speculations. Gentlemen preferred bonds, and he puts gentlemen in italics. And, you know, so people, and you even see it today where people get obsessed with their dividends, where when Buffett breaks out even his own stock portfolio, he says, okay, this is the dividends that came to the Berkshire shareholders, and these are the retained earnings that came to Berkshire shareholders. So the, the rational view really should be when you're looking at a portfolio, and, and this clearly is why Buffett puts this out there. He's stressing that, you know, for businesses that have higher higher returns on capital that can reinvest in their business, you would like that business to retain their earnings so they can re- reinvest at high rates of return, not to just give you the cash. So he says, you know, Buffett says, in our deployment of the funds we retain, we first seek to invest in the many and diverse businesses we already own. During the past decade, Berkshire's depreciation charges have aggregated $65 billion, whereas the company's internal investments in property, plant, and equipment have totaled $121 billion. So reinvestment in productive, that's the key word there, productive, operational assets will forever remain our top priority. And then he goes into his business criteria, which I'm not going to repeat. because that's Anyway, so then he goes to the top 10 largest holdings. And then he shows, you know, as an example, right, American Express. Um, they had $261 million in dividends, but they had $998 million in retained earnings. And Apple, you know, they received $773 million from Apple in dividends, but they, you know, with their 5.7% stake in Apple, they had $2.5 billion in retained earnings at Apple. And Apple can grow their, you know, their operations at high rates of return. So for Berkshire, that is essentially growth that is not being taxed again with a dividend. So there is that. Uh, he talks about the non-insurance operations and how some of them have been good, some of them have not been good. Um, there really was not anything new there. Uh, one little funny anecdote that he shares was he goes, I'm going to add one final item that underscores the wide scope of Berkshire's operations. Since 2011, we have owned Lubrizol, an Ohio-based company that produces and markets oil additives additives throughout the world. And on September 26, 2019, a fire originating in a small next-door operation spread to a large French plant owned by Lubrizol. Now, that's not funny, but this is what's kind of funny in, a, in kind of a weird way. The, results was, the result was significantly significant property damage and a major disruption in Lubrizol's business. And even so, both the company's property loss and business interruption loss was mitigated by substantial insurance recoveries that Lubrizol will receive. But as the late Paul Harvey was given to saying in his famed radio broadcast, quote, here's the rest of the story. Now, here's the rest of the story. Quote, one of the largest insurers of Lubrizol was a company owned by um, Berkshire. And then Buffett quotes the Bible, Matthew 6, 3. The Bible instructs us to, quote, let not the left hand know what the right hand doeth. Your chairman has clearly behaved as ordered. So I thought that was kind of funny. Uh, he goes into the property and casualty business and just shows how the float keeps increasing. This is what was interesting, too. He talks about how most PNC companies don't have the luxury of investing the way that Berkshire does because you need a lot of excess capital. So most insurance companies have gone to you know, very low interest rate bonds. Uh, so Berkshire has a competitive advantage there in a low interest rate environment. And then also talks about that you know when there will be a big disaster, which will happen at some point, it'll be it'll be you know Berkshire will have losses, but they will also increase their market share as other companies uh, you know blow up. Um, what else is interesting? Talks about Berkshire Hathaway Energy. Talks about the investments. Um, there really wasn't anything that interesting. 
there. Um, but he does say, so he says, this is one thing that should be noted. He goes, what we see in our holdings rather is an assembly of companies that we partly own and that on a weighted basis are earning more than 20% on net tangible equity capital required to run their businesses. These companies also earn their profits without employing excessive levels of debt. Returns of that order by large established and understandable businesses are remarkable under any circumstances, but they are truly mind-blowing when compared to the returns that many investors have accepted on bonds over the last decade, 2.5% or even less on a 30-year treasury bond, for example. And then he says that he believes that stocks will do better than bonds going forward, and that anything could still happen. Stock prices, including major drops of 50% or more, you know, it's the same old thing. And then he talks about the, um, you know, su- succession planning and, and sort of Berkshire after Charlie and Warren. And he says that, you know, three go- he goes, three decades ago, my Midwestern friend, Joe Rosenfeld, then in his 80s, received an irritating letter from his local newspaper. And in blunt words, The paper asked for a biographical data it planned to use in Joe's obituary. Joe didn't respond. So, a month later, he gets a second response, a second letter from the paper, this one labeled URGENT in all caps. And then Warren goes on to say, Charlie and I long ago entered the URGENT zone. That's not exactly great news for us, but Berkshire shareholders need not worry. Your company is 100 prepared for our departure. And he said that a book that has explored the Berkshire culture that he recommends is a book called margin of trust, which is a new book by Larry Cunningham and Stephanie Cuba. I hope Stephanie, I'm pronouncing your last name correctly. Um, this book will be available at the, at the annual meeting. Um, so that would be something to read. Larry Cunningham is a great author. Um, so highly, you know, I, I haven't read the book, but you know, here's a free plug for margin of trust and go out and buy it at the annual meeting and, and support the authors. Um, other than that, he says it's going to take quite a few years after Buffett dies. He says an estimate, I will estimate, he goes in all, I estimate that it will take about 12 to 15 years for the entirety of Berkshire shares. I hold at my death to move into the market. And he says that I feel, I myself feel comfortable that Berkshire shares will provide a safe and rewarding investment during the disposal period. And there's always a chance unlikely, but not negligible that events will prove me wrong. And I believe, however, there is a high probability that my directive will deliver substantially greater resources to society than would result from a conventional course of action. Key to my Berkshire only instructions is my faith in the future judgment and fidelity of Berkshire directors. They will regularly be tested by Wall Streeters bearing fees. At many companies, these super salesmen might win. I do not, however, expect that to happen at Berkshire. And then he goes on. This was, I thought, the most interesting part of the letter. And he talks about the misincentives at board of directors, that he's been on plenty of boards. Um, And he had said that um, compensation committees now rely much more on heavily on consultants than they used to. Consequently, um, compensation arrangements have become more complicated with what committee members want to explain. Uh, when, a, when a committee want, member wants to explain paying large fees year after year for a simple plan, um, the reading of proxy materials has become a mind-numbing experience. And he says that one very important improvement in corporate governments has been mandated a regularly scheduled, quote, executive session of directors of which the CEO is barred. Prior to that change, truly frank discussions of a CEO skills, acquisition decisions, and compensations were rare. And then he says that acquisition proposals remain a particularly vexing problem for board members. The legal orchestration for making deals has been refined and expanded, but I have yet to see a CEO who craves an acquisition, bring in an informed and articulate critic to argue against it, and yes, include me among the guilty. Overall, the deck is stacked in favor of deals that's coveted by the CEO and his or her obliging staff. And it would be an interesting exercise. So I think this was kind of cool. He goes, it would be an interesting exercise for a company to hire two expert acquisition advisors, one pro and one con, to deliver his or her views on a proposed deal to the board. With the winning advisor to receive, say, 10 times the token sum paid to the loser. 
But don't hold your breath while waiting this reform. The current system, whatever its shortcomings for shareholders, works magnificently for CEOs and the many advisors and other professionals who feast on deals. A venerable caution will forever be true when advice from Wall Street is contemplated. Don't ask the barber whether you need a haircut. And with that, um, you know, he does talk about that they bought back 1% of their shares. The last few months, they, you know, they, I think they ramped up their um, repurchasing. So they did about $5 billion in repurchases this year, which comes out to about 1% of the market cap of Berkshire. And then he said, um, shareholders having at least $20 million in value of A or B shares and an inclination to sell shares to Berkshire may wish to have their broker contact Berkshire's Mark Millard at 402-346-1400. And um, we request that you phone Mark between 8 and 8.30 in the morning or 3 uh, 3 to 3.30 p.m. Central Time. Calling if you are ready to sell. So... There might be some people that give a call to Mark Marlard in the next few months, and they'll be able to buy additional shares um, that way. Um, and other than that, there really wasn't much. The last thing he said was that um, there had been people saying that Ajit Jain um, and Greg Abel should have more um, time uh, to answer questions, and Buffett thought that was a good idea. And, you know, they're, they're um, going to have... They play substantial roles at the company and are going to have more substantial roles when Buffett and Munger die. So he goes, uh, shareholders who this year send a question to be asked by our three long-serving journalists may specify that it also be po- that it may be posed to uh, Ajit or Greg. They, like Charlie and me, will not have even a hint of what the questions will be. Uh, the journalists will alternate questions with those from the audience who can also direct questions to any of the four of us. So polish up your zingers. Um, and then he finishes it off by saying, on May 2nd, come to Omaha, meet your fellow capitalists, capitalists, buy some Berkshire products, have fun. Charlie and I, along with the entire Berkshire gang, are looking forward to seeing you. And then on behalf of the Intelligent Investing Podcast and me, um, I will be in Omaha, and I look forward to seeing some of you in Omaha. Uh, feel free to write me at intelligentinvesting at gmail.com. You can also follow me on Twitter. Um, at Eric Schlein, and you can follow the the show on Twitter at InvestingCast. Um, you can also add me on Facebook as well. It's just Eric Schlein, and um, that is a wrap to the show. And look forward to seeing some of you in Omaha. And would love to hear uh, your comments. Uh, would love to hear any uh, feedback that you might have, positive, negative. You know, share this episode. Some of you might be watching on YouTube. Some of you might be listening to the podcast. Please subscribe. And uh, by the way, you guys are amazing. Um, you know, we have over, we have close to 150,000 downloads now and um, about 4,500 subscribers. So I'm looking to get that number to 5,000. So please share this with your friends. And if you think I'm a total idiot too, you know, share it, share it as well. And say, but well, who's this idiot is talking some stupid thing about the Berkshire letter, you know, share, share that as well. And you can, you know, say all the nasty things you want about, about the show. Um, and for those who love it, you know, say all the nice things you want about the show too. So either way, um, I really appreciate, you know, the community that's come around the intelligent investing podcast. Of course, I love my Berkshire community and I see some of you, I will see some of you in Omaha. Um, I will be, um, there probably I'll get in on Thursday and, and, and be there from Friday, Saturday, and most of the day on Sunday. Um, With that, uh, have a great rest of your weekend. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Intelligent Investing Podcast with Eric Schlein. If you'd like to connect with Eric for questions, comments, feedback, ideas, or to inquire about being on the show, please contact Eric at intelligentinvesting at gmail.com. So, in the words of Charlie Munger, I have nothing to add.